We are going to begin. Uh, it is 11 a.m. Welcome to everybody who's able to join us today for our, um, well, we, we have a, a cafe as a standing tradition for Capitalize for Kids to make it so it's an opportunity to have access to experts in the field. And we have three terrific experts with respect to the provision of mental health care services uh, in Ontario uh, for today's conversation. And um, we're going to be doing it virtual just to the point that we were making before. Um, so to that end, we're happy to speak to and have everybody else from all over the world, essentially, uh, whether you're in Canada, Ontario or beyond, we're happy to have you. My name is Andrew Tischler. I'm the director of uh, Impact Consulting Services at Capitalize for Kids. Um, my title should actually give an indication that Capitalize for Kids is a little bit different in terms of other players in the space because we actually do have somebody who does consulting. Um, Capitalize for Kids has been in operation for about eight years. About four years ago, we introduced a stream to add on not just raising money and then handing checks over to organizations, but we wanted to make sure that we could uh, leverage as much uh, additional capacity for organizations who were helping and servicing uh, as possible. So for me, as someone who comes with uh, degrees in law and was at McKinsey and Company Consulting, it was really a rare opportunity to come and give that experience uh, and education towards a really um, just a beneficial space and field where I think we can add a huge impact. Um, and so what we're going to be doing today then is we brought these three speakers who I will uh, introduce very quickly uh, shortly. Um, we're going to have a conversation. This is meant to be more like a cafe, like the name the title suggests. So we invite you even now to start beginning sending your questions over to us uh, via the chat box. We will collect them. And then when the speakers have done introducing themselves, giving a little bit of an overview of how they see the situation, we'll dive right into your questions. Because again, we want to make this as useful, useful as possible. Thank you to the audience members who uh, completed the survey as to uh, what it is that they wanted us to focus on. We heard very loud and clear, you wanted the view of what's the 30,000 foot view on mental health uh, service provision for children then to hear what is the actual experience of organizations who are providing that care, the, the blocking and tackling. And then our panel very wisely suggested, we need to personalize and bring it right back down to the individual. Uh, ostensibly, people who are listening today are either parents themselves, thinking about parent, becoming parents one day, or they know people who have children. So these issues essentially touch all of us and, and everybody at any time. Um, so my aim today then is to, having said what I had to say about myself, Capitalize for Kids, is really to turn it over to the experts. I think that's why people are here more than anything else. Uh, and I'm happy just to high level mention that we're, we're, we're very blessed to have um, first speaker that we have on our panel, uh, Pranima, Dr. Pranima Sindar. She's the Executive Director of the Ontario Centre of Excellence for Child and Youth Mental Health. We also have Joanne Lowe, the Executive Director of the Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa as well as she is the VP of Mental Health and Addictions at CHEO, and as well, Zoe Daw, the Director of Clinical Leadership and Excellence at EveryMind Mental Health Services. So that's a, just a brief introduction, and I would like them to introduce themselves much better than I ever could do that. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Pranima Sindar, who will kick us off and uh, take us on the, the first steps in terms of having the presentation and the conversation. Please, Terrific. Pranima. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone who is uh, on the line. We can't see you, but uh, we know you're there. Uh, it's lovely to be here and, uh, you know, really value uh, the emphasis that uh, that people or the interest in children's mental health right now, particularly right now, uh, as our, our country, province and uh, world are moving through this pandemic. So I, I would like to just start off by painting a bit of a picture of what children's mental health looks like in the province of Ontario. Uh, so here in Ontario, uh, about 130,000 children, youth and families are supported by our publicly funded community based child and youth mental health system. And according to our partners at Children's Mental Health Ontario, there are more than 28,000 children and youth who are currently waiting for service. And sadly, some of those children and youth are going to be experiencing a wait of about two and a half years. Uh, and I think we can all agree that uh, those numbers are probably going to increase as we move through the pandemic and uh, that the acuity and complexity of their needs are also going
going to increase over time. So community-based child and youth mental health agencies provide a really critical, important uh, service. Uh, and, and that includes a range of essential core services on a continuum of care, all the way from early intervention to counseling and therapy to crisis intervention. And what we do at our center is support the, all of those agencies, both the lead agencies and the core service providing agencies to deliver excellent high quality care to children, youth and families. And we do that in two distinct ways. First, we mobilize knowledge. So we gather and distill the latest evidence from research, clinicians, and clients and get this information to the right people at the right time to make decisions about the best way to offer care. The second is that we focus on quality improvement. So we support agencies to look at their programs and processes, often in partnership with our friends at C4K. Um, and we help them to look at what's working well, what's not working well, and help them uh, to make change to support uh, really strong service delivery. So a couple of years ago, when we developed our latest strategic plan, we actually went out to the sector and asked, what would you say are the three to five biggest problems in Ontario's community-based child and youth mental health system? And given our center's role in supporting evidence-based service delivery, which ones do you think we have an opportunity to influence? And they came back with four. And uh, I'll go through them super quickly. And I know that we'll have a chance to talk more deeply about all of these uh, through, the, through the hour that we have together. But the first is around care pathways. So Often a young person, and I'm sure many of you on the on the phone would would sort of agree that uh, you know a young person rarely walks up to the door of a child and youth mental health agency. More often, young people are uh, identified in their doctor's office or in schools as having an issue. And what doctors and educators tell us is that they don't always know when there's a mental health problem because they were trained to be uh, doctors and educators and not child and youth mental health service providers. So they don't always know when there's an issue. And if they do think that there might be an issue, they're not sure where to send young people and their families for help. So that's one of the big things that we're working on is three key projects looking at strengthening those connections between community-based services, educators, primary care docs, early years learning centers, and so on, making sure that anybody that has occasion to touch the life of a child knows where to go for help and how to loop back and make sure everybody's on the same page around what those child's needs are. Uh, the second area is around youth and family engagement. So we've been doing youth and family engagement work since the beginning of our time. Uh, so for uh, about 18 years now, really working with organizations to help them to meaningfully engage young people and families at all level of the agency. Because when you have young people and families engaged well, you have services that are relevant and, and services that meet the needs of kids and families. Uh, and so we've been, we've co-developed a model of youth engagement and family engagement with young people and families respectively. And most recently we've co-developed standards of care to help ensure that this is happening in a consistent way and in a high quality way across the province. The third area that we're working in is in digital and e-mental health. And so for those who might have caught a snippet of our, our early conversation, this is an area that, you know, showed great promise, great opportunity to uh, deal with some of the access issues if you're using e-mental health or virtual care. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, it was the thing that was uh, that was being delivered. And so uh, we've supported service providers to build their capacity and skills in delivering high quality virtual care through the pandemic. We also had the uh, privilege of actually walking beside uh, all of these agencies to say what worked well and what didn't work so well in terms of that very rapid transition to uh, virtual care. And we tried to capture some of the lessons learned so that when we can all take a breath post pandemic, we can implement virtual care as a longstanding sort of meaningful way of delivering services, um, both as part of the blend of in person and uh, and e mental health. We've also most recently developed a guideline for virtual walk-in. So again, helping to remove some of those barriers to care that families uh, experience and making sure that a young person can do a virtual walk-in instead of having to you know, face sort of transportation barriers and, and time barriers and so on in getting that care in person. So we've developed some guidelines uh, for services to be delivered in this way, and those will be launched in the next month. Uh, and finally, the area that, uh, I, and I think this is a really nice way of transitioning over to Joanne, uh, we support a number of system level initiatives. So we partner with Ontario's lead agencies. There are 31 lead agencies across the province to advance a number of system level priorities. And the ones that we're most involved in at the center are really about collecting data for decision making and making sure we're doing that in a consistent way across the province and then using that information um, to help strengthen service delivery and also uh, working towards resolving some of those many barriers to access. And so uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to my colleague, Joanne Lowe. Thank you, Pranima, Dr. Sundar. Uh, 
Um, Pranima and I have known each other for a very long time. And uh, we were just saying earlier that uh, I don't think I've actually ever called her doctor before. Um, but thank you very much for having me here today. As, as noted, I'm Joanne Lowe, and I am the, uh, the Executive Director of the Youth Services Bureau. And I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about what's going on in the realm of child and youth mental health in Ontario, uh, and most importantly, about the powers of partnerships and of hope. Um, uh, as the executive director of the Youth Services Bureau, um, just to give you a sense of what we do, um, we are a multi-service agency that sees 3,000 high-risk youth each and every month of the year, um, and we do so across 25 sites in the Ottawa area, and our services generally fall into four categories, one of, of which include mental health, uh, youth justice, uh, employment and housing and supports. Um, I'm also the VP of Mental Health and Addictions at CHEO, uh, which is a pediatric healthcare center here in Eastern Ontario. All of this matters to me because, uh, not only because of the work that I do, uh, but because I am uh, the, an adoptive parent of three kids, two of whom needed uh, the help from mental health professionals when they were younger. And even though I worked in this field and have done so for almost 31 years, um, even I had huge challenges getting, the help, getting them the help that they needed in a timely fashion. And it, uh, as I was preparing for this, uh, this today, I was reminded about uh, someone that I worked with uh, when I was working as a, uh, a youth worker in, uh, in Toronto's Parkdale community many, many years ago. Uh, and, a, and someone who was very wise, who also had lived experience with mental health and homelessness, shared with me uh, that, uh, you know, Joanne, there's a very big difference between helplessness and hopelessness. And what he explained to me was that help Helplessness is, not, is about not having the tools that you need to be responsive and, and, to, and, to, and to be accessible. Whereas hopelessness, he said, is vastly different and quite frankly, a much bigger problem. And he strongly urged me to pay much more attention to the latter because without it, it is incredibly difficult to mobilize for change. So the work we do and I do and met with, along with many other uh, great people is, uh, is in mental health must actually be grounded in hope now more than ever. And it also needs to be practical and responsive so that we see the barriers and challenges that quite frankly get in the way of doing our best work for kids. There are no better advisors on this than youth and families who have that lived experience. And I wanted to share with you some of the uh, little few more details from uh, 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 from where Pranima started, of what we've actually heard from parents and caregivers and youth themselves. So sadly, five out of six kids will not receive the treatment they need. 28% of youth report not knowing where to turn when they want to talk to someone about mental health. 36% of parents in Ontario have sought help for their child. Of those, four out of the 10 didn't get the help they needed. Half of Ontario parents who have sought out mental health, uh, mental, mental health help for their children uh, said they face challenges in getting the services they need. And 75% of families surveyed through uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario indicated that it was extremely difficult or very difficult to know where to find help. If that wasn't startling enough, uh, Canada's youth suicide rate is the third highest in the industrialized world and 70% of mental health problems have their onset during childhood or adolescence. And again, if that wasn't enough, perhaps the most uh, startling uh, is, is really from an economics perspective. And that's that Ontario's per capita investment in healthcare was found to be about $1,361. For mental health care, and I always feel like I should do a drum roll here, it is a mere $16.45. So clearly we have a few problems to solve. The good news here is that there has been a remarkable mobilization to solve them. And clearly a combination of, of private and public uh, contributions have, have really uh, been keenly needed and in fact, in many cases, the private donors and contributions have allowed uh, for a lot more creativity and innovation to be to set up new services and reaching children that 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 can then be funded by government. In in our region, in the eastern region of Ontario, we have done just that 
we are establishing a new way of accessing and matching, matching kids and families to the right service at the right time. Uh, it is affectionately called One Call, One Click, and it is the first initiative, one of the first initi initiatives to be realized through the, the only pediatric health team in Ontario, Kids Come First, and we listened to our families and youth who wanted to be unburdened from the seemingly endless and hopeless search for the right service for their child. We have created many more virtual options uh, as well as in person, giving them the choice. And more importantly, we will be surrounding the child, the family, and the young person with the right combination of supports and treatment so that they stop falling through the cracks. This is the largest mobilization for kids in Eastern Ontario, and I dare say in Ontario to date, uh, involving 75 partners, 33 of which are from child and youth mental health and addictions agencies. Um, we have ha we received a very substantial contribution uh, from RBC to get this ball rolling, and we are now receiving gov some government funds uh, to continue to build on this great initiative. This is only one of many, many remarkable examples of uh, innovation across the province, and and it really is so important that these services. Uh, continue to, to be created and that we continue to find really significant ways to help kids and families. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, You've got a really good lay of the land in terms of provincially. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our role uh, and how we've worked with Capitalize for Kids. So thank you, Andrew, for the introductions. Uh, I'm Zoe, and I've actually been at Every Mind Mental Health Services exactly two years today. And I'm going to start with just sharing a little bit of a story, because as Andrew set the preface, we're all here from a lived experience role, directly or indirectly. And I was heading out on my first day of the job, May 6th, and I had butterflies in my stomach. And I was getting out to the door, I, I kneeled down and gave a hug to our, our youngest son. We're fortunate to have three wonderful boys. And he'd previously been having a little bit of struggles in kindergarten, kind of with using his words, using his hands. And, and my husband and I are both seasoned in the mental health field talked to him about, you know, doing a dragon breath. So when he was really angry, you know, breathing out fire. And when he was feeling stressed, you know, to try a rainbow breath. So I kneeled down, gave him a hug. And I said, oh, you know, Leo, mommy's got butterflies in his stomach. And he paused and said, oh, mommy, mommy, make sure you don't do a dragon breath. You'll burn the butterflies. Do a rainbow breath. And that launched me into why I came into children's and youth mental health. So by means of a background, I'd spent almost 18 years in the adult mental health sector. And had a lot of remarkable positions, working with wonderful people and having great impacts. And when this position became available to me and really understanding at the time our organization, we've gone through rebranding last year, uh, was Peel Children's Center. And as Pranima talked about 31 lead agencies, we are one of them and the largest uh, in the province. We employ over 220 staff uh, and we've seen over 5,500 uh, clients and caregivers in the past year. And the brand essence is about hope. And Joanne touched about that as well the impact we can have with hope. So fast forward about two weeks onto the job, I was in a meeting with my senior team colleagues and I understood this Capitalize for Kids group was coming to the table to start talking about a potential collaboration and partnership with us. And I got incredibly excited because for me, curiosity and building systems is about a sum of many parts. And one thing that we do very well in the children's and youth mental health system is we have exceptional clinical clinicians, highly trained, highly passionate, there's never enough time to do the quality of work they've trained for. They went to school to make a clinical impact. They didn't necessarily go to school to know how to be efficient or how to see you know, those numbers of kids that are always lining up in the wait times. So when we started having a conversation with Quentin and colleagues at C4K around where could we have impact based on our needs, um, and it, for us, counseling and therapy, which uh, as Pranima talked about is one of kind of our service delivery buckets, we realized that reducing wait times by supporting more clients and supporting kids while waiting was gonna be the, the focus of our project. So hence launched kind of our first engagement with uh, C4K and, and Bain was our consulting partner. And it was a deep dive into like just an incredible amount of work over a very short journey of 12 weeks. Um, we got toolkits. Uh, I think one of the things that stand out for me was a, an Excel spreadsheet that was called um, full potential. And for those of you that have kids that love Ninjago, that's always something you know, reaching your full potential. And I thought, wow, what a great way to kind of strive and work with our clinicians of doing that. And as I thought about the support kids while waiting and we're in mental health week this week, I really reflect often on the impact of talking about waiting lists. And Joanne touched on the numbers 
Waiting lists are such an internal administrative function. And when we talk about a view of 30,000 feet up and what we can do and the impact and, and partially why I shared the story about my little guy, you know, telling me what to do is in our sector, we actually are starting to invest more and more money upstream around targeted prevention, family capacity building and support. And the hope is, and that in teaching these skills to our young people who are incredibly resilient and incredibly curious, they won't become our future clients on these administrative wait lists. The kids that are and will always have those high needs, we need to get them services sooner. And the expertise that C4K was able to bring to our table really set us uh, as we moved into you know, the pandemic at the time that wasn't even on our radar to have a 28% reduction in our wait list for counseling and therapy, which was quite monumental for us. Um, we're actually now about to launch into our third project with C4K and, and we had a fortunate one kind of over the past year where we were able to develop a tool that helped our clinical leaders with decision making. Just like no two children are the same, no two clinicians are the same. And when we're always looking at quality improvement in the sector, how do we help clinicians understand their benchmarks? How are they doing in terms of their direct service time, their indirect service time? Because it is about high quality impacts and outcomes. So but just before we turn it over to questions, I wanted to share with you a quote from one of my favorite mentors. Um, and his name is Don Berwick. And for the health folks on the table, uh, you may know his name. He's the uh, founder of the Institute of Health Information. And he says, sum is not a number and soon is not a time. For our financial investors in today's audience, Don is to healthcare, and I hope I picked the right name, is what Benjamin Graham was known as in the financial world. I was looking up leadership gurus that would have a similar resonance for our audience. And I thought this was very poignant for uh, Capitalize for Kids. Benjamin was known as the father of value investing, which for the benefit of our child and youth mental health audience, involves identifying and buying undervalued stock that have the potential to grow over time. Isn't that like children, where we can actually see that we have not invested in a system to Joanne's point of just pennies against the, the whole um, funding for healthcare. But if we invest that growing over time, his belief system was that to calculate a company's intrinsic value, it relied on diligent research, thorough financial analysis, and certainly patience. Commodities that I know that working with C4K and their consulting partners has been monumental to receive and exactly what our sector needs to build balanced bench strength. So I'll turn it over to you, Andrew, for questions, but I really thought I wanted to highlight just the impact that Every Mind Mental Health Services and our clients and caregivers have received through our work with C4K. It's really helped us to build a strong team. We're a sum of many talented parts and the investments uh, in that alignment will just keep growing the system to reach its full potential. So Andrew, back over to you. Yeah, it's a very striking note to, to leave on, frankly, and really appreciate the input from the three of you. I'll have to uh, focus on which type of breath, dragon or otherwise, to be used. <laughs> but I do, I do appreciate these, these things. I was asking before, it's, um, it's a funny thing to uh, speak over this kind of medium. And I guess we've all started to adapt to it. Either it's maladaptive coping or hopefully it's better than that. But um, we, we can start to get into that sort of space. And also we get, we get past the kind of the big energy at the start of this kind of conversation to get to the more dialogue sort of uh, point of view and, and uh, approach to it. And to that end, I mean, there's one question that's come up, which is around the, the whole idea about what does it mean to actually have good child mental health care, and how to best support it, especially in the pandemic. Of course, you know, it's a very unique thing. Um, the pandemic did come upon us, but these issues I think are, are they'd happen no matter when they're going to happen. But it's a question of what is the, the better way to approach and engage the topics that come up. So me, myself, selfishly, I guess, uh, I have two, two children who are teenagers, and there are questions that float around I hear all the time. What are the kind of modifications to what we consider uh, healthy uh, uh, child mental health or how we can engage with them with things like TV time, screen time, and any, anything related to it? Uh, I'd love to engage the panel on that if anything comes to mind. Maybe we could begin with Pranima. Sorry, it takes a minute to unmute myself. So it's a great question, Andrew. And I think Joanne and Zoe would probably have a lot, uh, a lot of uh, great advice to share, uh, sort of from a clinical perspective. 
What I can tell you is that um, we've done some work to try and understand the actual impact of a pandemic on uh, children and youth and also their parents. So we've actually surveyed last year in April, we surveyed uh, Ontario's children, youth and families trying to get a sense of how the impact was affecting them early on in the pandemic. Now, a year later, we've just closed our data collection uh, to try and check in again with them. And the, the goal of this work is to understand uh, where they're at, understand what their needs are, and then understand, you know, how as a service sector, uh, we might be able to uh, equip ourselves to, to respond to these very unique needs. So what we're seeing is generally that there are two kind of large groups, and, and there's a lot of diversity within them, but two large groups of, of young people. This is how they're clustering. One group are young people who have had a diagnosis of a mental health issue or have struggled in the past. And for those young people, their mental health is getting worse. For young people who uh, had no pre-existing or you know, no sort of uh, identified challenges uh, related to mental health, their mental health is also worsening. So nobody's doing well. Um, and if they are potentially, you know, there are there are pockets of resilience. I think you know, some young people are doing well in some areas. And I think we need to pay attention to that and we need to learn from that. Um, but there are gener the general consensus is that kids are gonna need support. They're gonna need really deep support. They're gonna need a range of supports. Um, and when we talk about virtual care, and I know Lena had made a comment in the chat as well, um, you know, an important one, virtual care is not for everyone. Right. So what we're hearing from young people in our survey is there is a really nice even split between young people who think virtual care would be a terrific, easy to access kind of option. It gives them lots of advantages like, uh, you know, being able to access care, uh, you know, in, in a timely kind of way, being able to access care with a bit of privacy. They, they can go somewhere in their house or, or leave their home to actually get care and they don't have to be around the parents. Parent, the parents don't even have to know that they're getting this care. Uh, but there are also young people who want to talk to an actual person. So if I think about my own experience, I have a child that has historically struggled with anxiety um, and she uh, is a pretty reflective kid and she actually uh, has been doing pretty well through the pandemic. There's been some pockets of resilience there. Um, but when she uh, you know, has experiences of needing to talk to somebody, she wants to talk to her therapist. She wants Wants to actually speak to her therapist. She doesn't want to, you know, call it an anonymous chat line. She wants to actually speak with somebody who she has a relationship with. And I think the reason why she feels comfortable doing that is because she used to see this clinician in, in person as well. So I think we need to pay attention to what the, the, the preferences are of young people and their families and make sure that uh, people are receiving services in the right modality for them and in a timely way. I think I can't emphasize that enough. We do need to make sure that these children have uh, timely access to care because we know from the evidence that if you intervene early Early, you will save an awful lot of pain and struggle and also money. So when it comes right down to it, it's more cost effective to intervene early. And when I say intervene early, I mean intervene early for all kids uh, at the first sign of any kind of trouble. But I also mean intervene early in the age range. So we know that if you uh, support and, you know, the little guys are really, really struggling as well, uh, as are their parents. Uh, and if we have the opportunity to intervene, uh, you know, when children are under six, we save lots and lots, again, lots and lots of strife and strain, but also a lot of money later on down the road. So uh, maybe I'll pause there and, and turn it over to Joanne and Zoe for, for your thoughts. Yeah, if I can pick up quickly on the little people, just uh, the zero to six space is so important in terms of investment. I mean, we know kids are curious and, you know, and I, the teach back of how children teach children and the interventions and investments in the child and youth mental health system in those earlier spaces are quite remarkable. And I hope continue to scale because for every um, validated trajectory of a, of a family and a young little person who may not even be talking or walking yet to teach that kind of mirroring and modulation, that child goes on to build that skills resiliency. Like take a moment and think about watching children play on the playground. You probably don't have to wait more than a couple minutes to hear a child say to another child, hey, how did you do that? Right? So if we can teach those health resilient skills to little people, that then as they become tweens and teenagers, they become those peer supports to one another. That's that early intervention that we're actually building this as a lifestyle, just like, you know, we know we have to exercise and eat right. Like that's kind of core in our being, but that mental health skill set, it's harder to learn the older you get. It's harder when hormones kick in when you're going through puberty, but when you're tiny and it's natural, think of little Leo and his rainbow breath and his dragon breath. He does that now. He teaches it to his buddies, you know, check but we need to build that into the system. Yeah, thanks Zoe. I, I, what I would add is, you know, for those um, young people who, 
who for whom virtual is not really working out for them. Um, there are two really big considerations. One of them is, um, is to recognize, and I see this in the homeless youth that we serve at YSB, um, many of them don't have access to anything that would be sustainable in terms of virtual service or access to it. Um, and, and so uh, having different options such as chat uh, through a chat or through texting is always super important, but most importantly is making, uh, making services accessible. So rather than expecting them to reach out, to, to be bold about it and actually be present and available so that when they are ready that they will uh, reach out and, you know, one last comment, you know, structure and, uh, and, 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 and supports for families is super important. Um, one of the perhaps one of the most challenging things that I think we're going to see coming uh, going into the summer and into the fall is the the continued disruptions in terms of school um, will will start to play themselves out I predict in a way where um, we need to be careful about how we actually offer uh, different options to kids particularly those who are tending to isolate themselves further and not really reach out for help so outreach to those kids will be super, super important. Um, and one final piece, and I, I, you know, we've seen, there are some kids that are really, uh, we're seeing an explosion of, of needs. And one of those areas are certainly kids who suffer with eating disorders. Um, you know, just by way of example, um, at CHEO, we have, we would have seen um, a 60% increase from last year in the number of kids that are needing to be in hospital uh, as a result of an eating disorder. And um, they would also be much more acute and much more severe than they would typically have been a year ago or over a year ago. So looking for paying, paying attention to those needs and those aggravated needs is something that I think we also need to pay attention to. That's, it's great engagement. Thank you all for that. And I, I think we're really fortunate to have, there's the high level sort of view as to how we can engage on these pieces that Pernino is discussing. I think there's the, the kind of lived experience in terms of, you know, the people who have, are the most malleable, I guess, and why it's so important to address them at the zero to six piece. And then the numbers you bring, Joanne, I think are just striking, especially with that 60% increase, I think was the, the statistic. And that's just for one disorder. I, I'm sure there's all sorts of variation across a number of challenges people have. Um, we have. We do have a question from the audience here for Pranima, and it's, uh, it's asking, given some of the Ontario Auditor General reports on kids' mental health, it seems that many challenges in the sector have endured over extended periods of time. What do you think the biggest challenge to best practices that exist in the kids' mental health space are? It's an easy question. <laughs> yeah. Part, part, yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, to the person who posed that question, it's a, it's a really good one. It, it's not like, uh, and I've reflected on this a lot through the pandemic, it's not like we were sitting around twiddling our thumbs thinking that everything was peachy keen before the pandemic hit. What the pandemic has done is really exacerbate and or reveal all of the different challenges and the things that are broken with our system, right? So you've got issues with access, you've got issues with, uh, you know, uh, funding, you've got issues with, you know, you've got all kinds of issues. What I would say around best practices generally is that that's not something that I think the community-based child and youth mental health uh, system actually struggles with anymore. I think people are very invested in evidence-based service delivery and evidence-based practice is something that um, is embraced. Uh, you know, I have been an evaluator for over 20 years, and I can tell you that when I first started in my career, um, you know, I walk in to do some evaluation capacity building work, and people would be like, oh, not, not evaluation. Ew, 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 yuck, yuck, yuck. Um, if you talked about data, it was, uh, it was literally a four-letter word. Um, but I have seen particularly the community-based child and youth mental health sector that I've been involved in over the last decade and a half, really, I mean, embracing and demanding evidence-based care and demanding funds for evidence-based care and demanding funds and infrastructure for data and data systems, right? So I think that this is something that, um, you know, our clinicians, our service providers, our agencies are ready and poised to deliver high quality evidence-based services. They just need some of those barriers to be cleared out of the way. And part of those barriers have to do with funding and part of those barriers have to do with historical ways that people have accessed services that we need to dismantle and rebuild. 
maybe I'll pause there and see if my colleagues have other things to add. Well said, Pranima. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, <laughs> pretty, pretty complete answer. So thank you. Thanks very much for that. I mean, there, and I think your points are very good. And it's not as though everything was just fine before and then the pandemic happened. Now we have a challenge. It's there's an issue. I think the numbers Joanne brought up, and I think the surveys are giving some good feedback as well. Um, and I think in the meantime, uh, while you were answering the question, we got another question for the panel at large. Um, our healthcare, physical and mental, is very much reactionary. The dollars are spent once you have the heart attack or exhibit mental health challenges. I think this is Zoe's point as well, which she was speaking about being a little more preventative rather than just reactive all the time. So the question becomes, um, what needs to be done to become far more proactive in our approach? And what role do our traditional community mental health agencies have in delivering those types of services? I, I think, Zoe, if I could turn it to you. Sure, that. thanks, Andrew. And we did it at Every Mind. And I think this is, you know, there's a lot of proud moments through the pandemic. And you're absolutely right. Thank you for posing the question. You know, we know systems get the results they're, you know, they're designed to intend to do, right? So when we talk about wait lists and building wait lists, you know, and we have somebody asking, you know, where am I on the wait list? It's a fallacy, right? Because there's people ahead, there's people behind them, there's people who get added, there's people that drop off. When we talk about prevention, we quickly mobilized when the pandemic hit. Uh, we were fortunate to have a team of four psychologists um, whose role was doing specialized assessment and consultation. And we couldn't see those kids immediately. We were looking on how to, how would all of those batteries of tests move into a virtual space? So we had high talent, evidence-based resources that could do different. So we moved into this, how do we educate our community? We have parents who need these skills. They don't know what it's like to have their kids not go to school, right? They don't know how to deal with all these big emotions because their teenager can't leave the house because of the fear of the pandemic. So we actually, over our, the last um, 12 months, successfully delivered 86 different webinars with 13 topics and over 1,700 different participants. And we're really proud of that because what we believe happened out of that is that spread of information to the question. So rather than that reacting of, you know, I don't, I'm going to send my kid to the system, we hope and believe that now we have some parents and caregivers that can help with alternatives. And, you know, I think for many of us, you know, we talk about teenagers and screen time and that question came up as well is most kids don't have an alternative. And Joanne talked about eating disorders. I mean, exercise is a privilege. I mean, in Peel, which is one of our, you know, fair share of Peel, grossly underfunded, many of our families live in high rise apartments. The only way those children were getting physical activity was going to school, walking down the street, having two nutrition breaks and recesses and playing with their friends, that's gone. So we really need to think about, yes, virtual care is wonderful and it's catapulted many of our systems years ahead of where we would have been but it's an and with, and we have to build back into the system, those resources and absolutely using dollars differently just because we've always spent them in these traditional ways. We as a system have to listen through our surveys and, and the feedback from our caregivers and youth and kids directly on what do they need? Because what we do know is that when we give a kid an option or a family an option, they often pick the path of least resistance. They pick the simpler solution. And yet we feel in this kind of pejorative state, we have to put them on their wait list because their needs are so severe. Yes, their needs probably are very severe, but if we can start to build in other aspects into the system upstream, like, hey, attend this webinar, or here's a group you know, that your kid can log on online or actually build back into in-person, maybe some of those kids won't need that big intervention as we go. I mean, that really is the hope and we're, we're testing that. And that is a lot of the work that we're doing, you know, through our partnerships with our C4K initiatives. Yeah, the only thing I, I would add is, you know, uh, the, the most successful change where we've seen the greatest amount of improvement is, is when it's, it's, a, it's a number of different organizations and people who get involved, get behind a solution. And, um, and there's, there's where the competition, if you will, kind of, which, which of course we've all been set up to, to, to be in uh, through the funding streams. Um, it's a game changer because, and, and, the, and, and alongside of that, as Zoe said, ha, you know, families and youth are the experts in all of this. And it, whenever we see them as experts, we have the better solutions that get put into place, whether that be at an individual level, that whether that be at an organizational or a broader systems level. And, and you know, one of the things that I, I, I think we probably need to be thinking about even going, going forward um, 
and in and out of, out of this pandemic is we need to stop othering mental health and start seeing mental health, quite frankly, as a public health issue, um, because that's what it is. It, you know, someone, when we're trying to offer help, mental health services to someone who can't, doesn't have a roof over their head, that just doesn't make any sense. And so, and nor, nor should it make sense that we should actually be looking at the person as a whole person, as opposed to a number in line, or as Zoe said, on this very arbitrarily understood uh, wait list that they might or happen to be sitting on. Because there are a lot of people who are not on those lists and need the help as much as those who are on the help, on the, on the list. We can't hear you, Andrew. Oh, there hello. You go. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, uh, I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Pranima. There, I didn't want to walk over you there, but I wanted to give you a chance oh. if you wanted to speak to it. Very yeah. concerning <laughs> answers. <laughs> no, I think the points are all well engaged. I think uh, interesting uh, pieces about it all in terms of uh, what's been done in order to adapt to what's going on in the given the current situation, getting it out into the into the, the market is the wrong word, but in the ecosystem for people to actually know more about what they need to do. And I think it's a very interesting point, Joanne, that you bring up in terms of the fact that the way that the system is set up by, by necessity, it makes people competitors who otherwise would not necessarily want to or need to be. Um, we received a question from the audience um, that, that speaks directly to that point. We could spend a long time on this. I think it'd be useful to really make a very tight response on this one, I believe, and then actually speak to I think there's another question it begs after. So that's how I'm gonna bias the, my asking this question. Uh, the question is, given the comment on the spending in kids' mental health, just how much more money needs to be allocated to the kids' mental health space? Is it 10 to 15% more or 100 to 200% more? Is money the only shortcoming? How often we hear about a lack of psychiatrist, psychologist, psychologist. does money actually solve this? Yeah, back to you. Yeah, sorry. You know, of course, money won't solve everything, um, but there is a a stark difference in the spending for mental health than any other health care, and so at the very least, getting it to be equal to or proportional to the need would be what we what I think we need to see happen in recognition of again just not othering mental health mental health is a health care issue and it needs to be addressed with the appropriate resourcing um, I, I would also say that you know one of the big challenges that we have now is um, is our workforce um, we we have uh, uh, staff, people that work in the community-based child and youth mental health sector are notoriously uh, among the lowest paid people working in the healthcare system. Um, they often, and you know, the, the, uh, the issues of, of recruitment and retention are ongoing in, in particular areas of the province right now. And so really supporting our workforce um, is something that we also need to think about. And that is about money. Not exclusively, but that is about money. And uh, but I would say that you know um, the other thing that happened that's happened is that historically the funding streams have really paid for uh, we be, we get money to pay for specific people or specific disciplines, um, and that that kind of. Uh, thinking is really detrimental to actually setting up services in the way that they should be set up. And so, uh, you know, taking advice from the sector about what is needed and how it's needed in partnership with children and uh, with youth and families is the only way that we, I think we will get it right. And, and we have exam lots of examples of that across the province that I think we need to build on. So, you know, when people ask me how much money I think we need, I always say at least equal to what the rest of the healthcare system is getting. Um, and I would even argue that the, the, the cost, the financial impact of mental health on families is far, far greater than perhaps a lot of other healthcare issues that, that we experience. That people experience but there's an evening out that i think needs to happen and i think uh i, I but i do not believe that that's the only solution but uh, having the right resourcing goes a long way to actually doing the right things for kids yeah and just to pick up on that you know money not being the only shortcoming just so folks are aware it's only been the last couple of years where children's and youth mental health moved to the ministry of health as the funder mm -hmm. okay but, but you need to appreciate that on that child's 18th birthday they no longer belong to the child and youth mental health system so there's a fracturing 
in terms of transitions. We've all been teenagers, we know teenagers, like that is the worst time to drop people off because of bureaucracy of money. So for me, it's really, a dollar's a dollar, it comes from the ministry. Why does it have to disappear and re-wait for that service and that transitional aged youth piece? And this is a space, Joanne, you've spoken a lot about. We are disproportionately losing youth to suicide. We're losing youth that have a, a place in their healthcare system that don't know where to go because the money drops off. So really a big part of this is a whole kind of system redesign because the one thing that we all experience is we age, right? We age and even older adult mental health. You actually age out of being an adult into older mental health, right? So, you know, dread your 64th and 364th day birthday because now you're in a whole other system later on, right? And, and I think it's really important to realize that because the system really does a disservice to youth and how those gaps in care just fall off. Yeah, I, I would just add a couple of things. I think that the, the most compelling case that, uh, you know, could be made uh, around the investments is the return on investments, right? So I think that if you invest early and investing early means investing in children and youth, uh, even perinatally, uh, if you invest early, the return on the investment is just so significant. Uh, so if you follow a young person who's had challenges, you know, when they're three, four, five years old, those challenges get worse when they're nine, 10, 11, and even worse when they're 13, 14, 15, and even worse, and so on and so forth. And, and then they're, they're now a burden to the adult mental health system. And, you know, they, there are lots and lots of complexities that come with that. So I would say, you know, we need to look at the return on investing early, and it's significant. I think the other thing is that, you know, the money needs to be there because I would, as an observer of and supporter of children's mental health, uh, the sector has aligned itself so significantly over the past several years. I mean, the lead agency model having come in in 2014, 15, um, I've just watched a great alignment and synergy happen between those lead agencies, so much so that they're aligned in identifying what the provincial level priorities need to be. So we've identified what those provincial level uh, issues are, and now we just need the resourcing to help enact them. And we need implementation barriers to be removed. So we need some of those, the stumbling blocks to be taken away, including things like uh, you age out of one system and you have to enter another system, including things like you know, we don't have the infrastructure to actually collect this data. We don't have the infrastructure to house the information. Uh, how are we supposed to, you know, use that data for decision making if we don't have good quality data and systems to support that? So I think, you know, again, I, I, a nod to the lead agencies in the province who have been working really, really hard to become aligned. I think now what they need is for barriers to be removed and investments to be made. The other point I would make is that, you know, not all mental, child needs mental health services cost the same. So, you know, when there are investments that are made, um, there's always this tendency um, to, to, to try and create as many uh, services as possible, as opposed to concentrating on what service is actually needed. So, you know, across the province, we have a fairly robust, I would say, uh, walk-in capacity or brief services capacity for children, youth, and, and, and families, but we, we do not have sufficient services that are for those kids who experience much more severe um, and complex mental health issues. And those cost more money. And so, and they tend, and because they cost more money, the unit cost is higher, which means that you actually uh, can, can serve fewer people for the same amount of money that you would you would actually have available for some of those brief or lighter touch services, which are which are really important and essential in the system. But having the right mix of services means having uh, appreciating that and understanding that not all mental health services cost the same. And so every time there's an investment and the the push from from I'll say the government mostly to actually create more create more units of service means that it's at the cost of us pushing kids through more quickly through those briefer services. And, and, and then that creates the fragmented care where they start and stop service. And then they're, so the, the continuity of care is, is just chunked and, and parceled out in such a way that the experience is that kids and families say they don't, they don't know uh, what's going to happen next for them. So they hang on to the service that they have for fear of getting nothing once they finish that service. And that's, that's a serious problem and it's not healthy. 
I mean, it's great engagement. I, I, it's some striking takeaways that come to me. The first one being that, to Pranima's point, the, the language that we've been using in this conversation, I think, would have been anathema to a lot of people before to talk about return on investment or the unit cost and those kinds of things. But I think the overall picture that you're presenting between the three of you, and I think with most people I've spoken with in the, in the, in the ecosystem, is that there's a willingness, there's a desire to become more data enabled and to, to optimize against those. But the, the basic things like, to Pranima's point, not even having the servers or even the hard drives in the cloud, if you want to use that, to, to capture the data and actually do something with it. So there, it's not a question now anymore of winning hearts and minds. Everybody's, the, the hearts and minds are won. They just need way more low level sort of things. They're, they're on board, everybody's into it, but they don't have what they actually need to execute against it. And there's that, that challenge there that really comes up. And it's funny because, all these points that are being made, you can call it return on investment, you can call zero to six how important it is. When it's a, a concept that's old enough that there's a saying around it, you know that it's been there for long enough. So when people talk about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, they were saying that long before I was around. And it, it, it still matters. And it's that much more important, especially in this space, when you think about the trajectory of never mind how well that one child is thriving, it's all the problems that they and all the people around them are not having to endure not having it had it been treated early on. Sorry, I, I took it a little bit there, but it, I thought it was a really salient and important point. Um, so I think I just want to highlight, I think we have about, uh, call it eight minutes left. There's another question we have here. I want to just see uh, the way I'd like to wrap up the conversation if possible. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that the question to end it off, and I, I'd like us to give, call it 11.55, each of you a minute. And I think to, to follow on Zoe's point, I think Joanne's as well. Um, what is the vision for the hope? What is the ideal that we're actually, if we had it, that we're aspiring to? What is it we're, we're seeking to get? And so that people who are listening can understand where they can actually contribute to helping reach that goal. How can we get there? It's definitely a capitalize for kids. We, we definitely seek to enable in terms of helping with optimization of processes and, and those kinds of pieces, but really to enable the vision you have to, to treat what we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis as a as a province, as a city, as, as, as individuals, uh, would very much like to invite that, that answer. Uh, in the meantime, as you're thinking about it, um, there was a question that came in which asked, it said, there have been a discussion about challenges in finding the right door. I think it's a, it's a nod to Joanne's uh, conversation or, or piece. Uh, and at every turn, it is said to be difficult to navigate the space. What is the solution to finding the right door for your child? Do we need more Sunnybrook navigator platforms, for example? Maybe Joanne, uh, since you had teed up the conversation. Yeah, so this business of uh, one door for care or one door for everyone has been, you know, floating around out there for as long as I've been in the sector. Um, and what I would say is it's not so much about the door. It's about what they get behind the door and that what they get behind the door is good quality services that are accessible and that they know what they're getting as they walk through that virtual or whatever door it is. Um, and I think we also, so I think that the, the idea would be that, you know, there, there, needs to, there need to be many options for people because people uh, seek help in many different ways from many different people. So the more informed people are around mental health, the better access people will get to the help that they need in a timely fashion. So, you know, uh, but I would always say that the door is important for sure. And suiting everybody who's, who actually has a door into services to be to have a common understanding of how to get people the help they need is super important. And I do think system navigation is part of that, but it's not the only solution. And I think part of what we always find ourselves getting into is looking for the panacea or the, the, the new shiny penny. Um, and I would say that, you know, there are lots of really good options based on the service system as we have it. It just needs to be far, far better integrated. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add to that, Joanne, it, we have to catch ourselves of not being competitive um, and that there's one agency and one pathway as a one size fits all. I've had great experience recently with our community and safety well-being plan in Peel, and we bring the highest needs, you know, kids to this table. And I have never seen so many agencies rally with a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And next thing you know, this kid is, 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 is caught, right? And they're moving forward. So let's just catch ourselves as a system around, you know, I agree, Joanne, I've been hearing no wrong door for far too long. 
but that's the community telling us that we're kind of stuck in this colloquial space. I'm a huge believer in coordinated access. I came from the adult mental health system and helped build a system in another region that way. It works. The problem is, is as you said, the door that's behind it. So if we're screening a child today for what they need today, we got to darn well be ready to give it to them tomorrow. Otherwise, it's just like buying your child a pair of shoes today and telling them to put that same size on in the December holidays and expecting it to fit. No, their foot's grown, their needs grown, right? So our system is okay at the front door. It just fails miserably because of the wait times um, and not the right kind of checks and balances and those little peppering of different interventions because um, it's the perception of waiting, right? It's not about the wait list. It's what they don't get during that process. It's a, it's a very, very good point. Oh, muting, yeah, that's good. It's a very, very good point and uh, well engaged. Uh, Pranima, I'm gonna offer you the opportunity, but I won't, I won't uh, force you to if you don't need to. I think, I think my colleagues have done a great job of answering that question. Very fulsome, fulsome answers, honestly. Uh, I, I believe that anybody who did ask questions got, got the appropriate level of engagement they were hoping for. Um, it being 11.55 right now, I do want to invite each of you either individually or coordinated manner to, to Zoe and Joanne's point. Um, is there some kind of a, a vision we can be hopeful for, um, that we can aspire to both post pandemic, I think Zoe at one point uh, in our conversations you mentioned, it's not about going to normal, it's about continually moving forward. So is there a vision that people can leave this conversation saying, you know what, I feel uh, inspired and I understand what we're aspiring to, to, to reach in the future somehow? Um, for whoever wants to engage first, or maybe Pranima has been, been the quietest so far in the past little bit, I, I'll mm -hmm. offer you a little bit of the floor if you like. And we, we do nobody, have a top of it. Nobody ever calls me quiet, Andrew. <laughs> 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 quiet. Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, look, at, I think that as, uh, you know, somebody who plays a leadership role in, in this sector, as a person who has my own family, my own circle of friends, this past year has been unbelievable. And I think that the way that we've gotten through it is by paying attention to some of those silver linings. So there's lots of crap, right? To be indelicate about it. Lots of terrible stuff that we, we've all experienced uh, and some much more than others. I think though that keeping a, a focus on some of those silver linings is the way that we're gonna get through uh, to, to Zoe's point, to this new kind of normal. Uh, so one of the silver linings from my perspective is that mental health is no longer this weird thing that some random person out there has. It has affected every single family, every single individual has struggled with their mental health from at some point during this pandemic. And so it's no longer a thing that somebody else has. So it's not, um, it's, it's not a new thing. I think that that is, that is good. The stigma is, is going. The challenge with reducing stigma though, is that it then increases need. And so I think that that's where we need to be uh, focused in the future is thinking about meeting those needs. I mean, whether it's, you know, that we're languishing or whether it's that we're experiencing social malnutrition. I think people have heard mm. some of those buzzwords in the, in the media. Uh, you know, everybody's gonna need support and I think that, you know, we need to figure out how to do that in a way that is responsive to every child and youth's needs. Uh, and we need to do that with a view to, you know, again, restructuring in a way that's not the same way we were doing things before, but with a new vision. And that new vision needs to be inclusive, it needs to be accessible, it needs to be well resourced, and it needs to be evidence based. And so that's where I would say, uh, sort of, uh, that's my sort of, uh, you know, perspective on where we need to go next. Yeah, I, I would, well said, uh, Pranima. Um, the only thing I, I would add, and, and you know, one of the things that I we've constantly heard from families in particular, uh, as we're setting up the one call, one click, kids come first, is this concept of catching and holding. And uh, what that, and so when we started to unpack that, or I, we were asking parents to kind of describe that to us, what they said is that if you want us to be confident in the services and the, in the system, you need to actually have some, give us some assurance that you're going to catch us when we're about to fall and you hold us up when we need it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's super important for us to, to always keep in mind. Beautiful. And, and my last kind of two cents to that, Andrew, about hope is be kind, be kind to ourselves as parents, be kind to our kids. I mean, this is, as Pranima said, like it's a terrible time. And if our kids aren't the kids we knew before the pandemic, give them hope that they'll be a different, stronger, more resilient kid after. And I don't mean that to undermine the serious mental health issues, but when we talk about the vision for the future. We have to tell our kids that it's not what's going on for them right now isn't their fault. And we believe in them and we hold that place 
whatever that looks like in the future, because it's not when the pandemic's over. The pandemic's, you know, officially over by the World Health Declaration at some point, but the effects of it are going to last. And our kids' mental health will persevere through that. And what we want to do is look back and say, whenever that time is in the future, the hope is you got through it. And now look at the skills that you have or look at you know the ability or you've started to get the professional services that you need and that point around stigma reduction and service needs. So that's my hope as a parent is, is don't be hard on ourselves. Don't be hard on our kids. Have hope because at some point in the future, things will be brighter and we need to hold that space for them that they'll be able to flourish in that environment. I think it's a wonderful way to wrap up the conversation this morning. Uh, I want to thank each of you uh, personally and on behalf of Capitalize for Kids for really engaging uh, in, in you know, conversation, introduction for a number of topics that people might not have been aware of. Uh, and really want to say a deep thanks again. The panelists have all said they're willing to be contacted by anybody in the audience with respect to anything they said individually about the system overall, uh, anything about treatment or any of those elements related, they're open to it. Capitalize for Kids is definitely uh, engaged in, in supporting all of the organizations we're happy to work with any others that we can support anywhere in, in Canada to improve capacity for, for kids' mental health. And uh, we wanna thank the entire audience for joining us. Thank you for giving us your time, your attention, your questions, and also for your financial support. Um, to, to not make too subtle a point, we're always happy to engage in terms of any prospective donor. We want to give back, not just to the community, but to our donors who care about these things and, and give data that's gonna be useful to them. And um, we, we have a link that's been shared by, uh, by Capitalize for Kids in the chat uh, box as to how to, to donate to Capitalize for Kids. We also have a link on our website where you can find more information about who we are, what we do, and some, uh, some knowledge transfer documents that we provide for free to the ecosystem to allow everybody to benefit. So on that note, on a, on a beautiful uh, Thursday afternoon here in Toronto, uh, a deep thank you again to all three of our panelists, Pranima, Joanne, and Zoe. Thank you again. And thank you to all of the, uh, the great questions in the audience that we had. We look forward to speaking to you soon and, and more throughout the rest of the year. Thanks very much and speak to you soon. Goodbye.